This is the Dominic Foxworth Show presented by Allstate. Well, I guess this is a pre-Dominic Foxworth Show presented by Allstate. We got a whole show coming up with Bill Barnwell where we go through a bunch of the events of the weekend, but we wanted to stay up late and tack on a little discussion about probably the marquee game of the weekend, Ravens versus Bills. And it appears that the Ravens care about our sleep because they put this thing away early. The Ravens are so back. <laughs> I mean, okay. The Ravens, you uh, started looking it up because you were pointing out how the Ravens do this in primetime games. It feels like every year. Yeah. And they were killing people last year in these big moments. Like, I think they did it to the Lions. They did it to the 49ers was the big one on mm-hmm. Christmas, right? Yeah. And they crushed also the Dolphins. 56-19. They, they were crushing people in primetime games. So I should not be surprised by this, but I got to be honest. I'm a little surprised by the way that the Ravens just kind of dominated this, oh, I guess dominates. So the score shows domination, assuming the final score is it's 35 to 10 while we're taping this. The right. Ravens have the ball in the fourth quarter. Yeah. The score shows domination. It didn't feel like the way those games last year felt like, where the Ravens just, it felt like the Ravens are better, which kind of surprised me because I think coming into this game, I thought the Bills might have been the best team in the, the AFC. Close, yeah. And, the Ravens kind of stomped that out quickly. Yeah, I mean, the leaves are turning, <laughs> and it's becoming tractor seat this season. The last two weeks, we've had like 330-plus uh, yards from Derrick Henry in the last two weeks. He had an 87-yard touchdown run on the Ravens' first play from scrimmage where he had the same top speed as uh, Xavier Worthy. Um, here's the thing, though. He weighs 80 pounds more than Xavier Worthy. I mean, 80. So, I, I get it. That is fast. Zero yards I, after contact, though. So Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody contact him? No. No, no one touched him at all. Zero whole yards yeah. after contact. No, no one even touched him at the end. Okay, so the reason why I rolled, that, rolled my eyes at that stat a little bit. Like, it's cool, and it's shocking to hear. But Xavier Worthy, this is on Xavier Worthy's touchdown play? four yard touchdown. Yeah, he was looking back while running. Like, he didn't get the full speed. Derrick Henry was just running straight full speed. It's still... So it sounds like I'm being a hater. It's still incredibly impressive impressive for a man who's been around as long as he has, who's as big as he is, to run 21 miles an hour as fast as hell. And he made those um, Bills DBs look pretty slow. He put some green between him and the Bills DBs. Um, and this is someone we thought might have been washed after the foot injury, and he was sort of on like a downhill. He wasn't having the explosive plays. Uh not so fast, my friend. Yeah, he's got, at this point, almost 200 yards, like 180-something. Yeah. He probably won't give him the ball anymore um, after this. He could have had another touchdown, but he decided he wanted to fumble it forward to uh, Ricard so he could get a touchdown instead. Uh, Does that count as a thick six? We'll have to ask you. Nah, Ojo. I don't think He's 300 so. pounds, but he has a he has 40. A 40. Yeah. Nah, nah, you, he, you don't get that stolen lineman valor. You better get 50s to um, 70s, or you don't get thick six points. I don't care how much you weigh. Um, um, go ahead. Should we talk about a couple of the implications from this game? Sure. So I think it's fair to say that this was a must must win game for the Ravens. I know their division, the Steelers are three and one. Mm-hmm. Um, no one really believes in Cleveland. The Bengals have a really rough defense. They're one and three. Um, but this is an important game for the Ravens. How much do you think it actually changes the fortunes of their season? Or is this team always so good that they're always going to bounce back and be on the track that they're on now? I mean, I, I think it changes the fortunes of their season. I know some some of our friends don't believe in momentum, but I'm sure they believe in like an emotional um, <laughs> impact. So, like, I think it does matter. There's a chance that they could win enough games, even had they lost this game. But it feels good to win this game against a good opponent. It reminds you because there were questions about this team after, after how after down- the last two weeks there yeah. should have been. They they blew the they almost would lead to the Cowboys. And they blew the, uh, so lead the Raiders. The yeah, the yeah. Raiders the week before. So. But it's not even it's not even that they blew those leads or almost blew those leads. It's also that they didn't feel as dominant, or they there were questions about how good their defense could be, because they haven't been that good so far this season. There were questions about their ability to protect Lamar. Yeah, and maybe some people questioned his accuracy, which those people are stupid because he is incredibly accurate today. I'm one of those people. <laughs> that's it. People are gonna say that's me. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. To be clear, it was not Charlie. So, um, I think that it. To be fair, the game script changed early because they got up by a big lead, and they also they always had. I think that's one of the things that we have to remember going forward is when you have the kind of two-way go essentially of having a lead or not being trailing 
you don't you're not forced into that situation where you have to drop back. And they were running the ball so well that they never got caught. At least in the times when it mattered, they never got caught in unfavorable downs. And frankly, when they did get caught in those must pass downs like Lamar threw accurate passes, there were a couple of drops through the course of the early part of this game that uh, I think they would have converted the third downs that they didn't convert. So, yeah, Lamar was impressed that this team was hitting on all cylinders, which is to be expected when the score is as impressive as it was. Um, you got other implications? Uh, yeah, I mean, we should talk about the Bill side of it. But if I were to tell you, looking at the receiver's box score, that the Ravens' leading receiver would be Justice Hill with six receptions for 78 yards, and after that, no one had more than 26 yards, Jeez. and it was 35 to 10... <laughs> You'd be shocked, right? I would say, did Derrick Henry have 180 yards? And the answer would be yes. He had 191 <laughs> yards. Um, from the Bills' side of it, does it change? Okay, so they obviously played a really sloppy first half. They got a tiny bit going in the second half before a really weird trick play where uh. Josh Allen was split out wide. Curtis Samuel took the snap. They tried to do a little reverse pass, and Josh Allen got annihilated and fumbled. Kyle Van Noy stripped him. But overall, do you think this does a game like this? Is it just a throw it in the trash, or do you think it changes the way you think about the Bills at all? No, nah, it doesn't change the way that I think about the Bills. I think it brings me back down to earth about the Bills. Yeah. Uh, the thing that I've been most impressed about the Bills, and I've said this a bunch of times on this show and other shows, starting back last season when they needed to win a bunch of games in a row to make a playoffs, and their defense was depleted. They found a way to make play effective defense. They adjusted their offense and were more uh, more efficient and effective offensively without the risk of turnovers. And so I came into this season as one of the few people who thought that the Bills would be able to continue that. And they had continued it to some degree yeah. until today. And so it doesn't change my mind. I think that they lost another safety in rap. Taylor Rapp. Yeah. Probably his concussion. We're yeah. guessing based on getting knee in the head by Derrick Henry. Which, yeah, that, that'll rattle the brain. So uh, I think it doesn't change a whole lot for this team. I think the... The ceiling on this team is low, but I still think they'll bounce back, though. I still believe they will win the division, and they'll be, by the time we get to the playoffs, and they're a pretty young team. They're probably, by the time we get to the playoffs, I don't think that it'll be a foregone conclusion that either the Ravens or the Chiefs, like there's nobody in the AFC. It's hard to say coming off what the Ravens just did to them, yeah. but this um, Bills team will keep getting better, and I guess the Ravens, have a chance to get better also and now that they finally seem to be co coalescing around an offense that is based on Derrick Henry being superhuman. I mean, yeah, we're in tractor seat this season and um, I feel confident that the Ravens and the Bills, they're going to be the nobody wants to face them in the playoffs team. <laughs> Both of them? Yeah. And then they're going to face each other in the conference championship? No one's going to be happy. <laughs> we'll find out. All right, let's see what's up with our man Bill Barnwell and the rest of the NFL. Off top, the College Football Award for the Best Kicker is named after Lou Groza, who went on to play in the NFL, made six All-Pro teams as an offensive tackle, not one as a kicker. Play music! This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. Welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show, presented by Allstate. Throw your hands up. We are joined, as always, by my lovely co-host, Charlie the Vanilla Snack Kravitz, and my Monday buddy, Bill Barnwell, who is fresh to death tonight. He brought out some patterns for us. He's stepping his game up. I see you, Bill, stepping that game up. They call this the Grosser, where I'm from. <laughs> mm. Big Lou. The you know his nickname was The Toe? Ooh, I don't know if you want the nickname The Toe. I yeah. feel like that's some... If you're a six four tackle, I, I feel like I'd be offended if you want to. He called me the toe. Yeah, like what? I'm the toe. I spent all game protecting the passer and driving people into the ground, and you gonna call me the toe? Because one time I hit a game winner for 16 yards out. Yeah, I I, I don't think he was getting on wiki feet. It's my it's mm. my hunch. <laughs> Probably not. My favorite thing about the 1950s All Pro t teams, as we were looking at him, is Lou Groza was on an All Pro team with Doak Walker. He was on an all-pro team with Chuck Bednarik. They were just giving out college award names willy-nilly to the 1950s guys. Yeah, we, we know what happened. Yep, we, we know what happened. <laughs> they, they, yeah, Dick Nitrate Lane showed up, and they said, oh, our time is running out. Let's start naming these awards now before we have to give them to somebody else. Oh, hold on, Bill. Did you know that Tom Landry was the original Cooper DeGene? All pro defensive no. back. No, I did not. Well, also actually, a punter. To be, to be all fair, all pro corner. To be fair, 
the whole all pro team were the original Cooper DeGene. That's back true. Then. Again, Dick showed up and everybody got nervous. The, the funniest part was they, I don't know if he counts as, as a white corner, Tom Landry, because he was called a defensive halfback on the uh, oh, on the all pro nice. team. Yeah, did they throw the ball like five, four or five times a game back then? Something like that. They were just out there getting three yards a pop. Well, I, I think Tom Landry <laughs> helped the Eagles more than Cooper DeGene did today. So Nice job. Way to set us up for a transition. Because hmm. I was definitely going to go down a rabbit hole of how come we don't say four or five yards a pop anymore. We used to say a pop. We don't do that oh, anymore. Oh, you can blame Bill for that. Bill, you, yeah. you stopped yeah. it? Explosives we, running we backs don't matter. Four yards a pop is bad for your <laughs> offense. Nah. I, I miss I miss my uh, pop water coach who's like, hey, we just gonna run the ball and, and get get about six yards a pop. We'd be all right. We get six yards a pop. That's all nope. you gotta do. <laughs> That's all you gotta do. Get six yards a pop. Ah, uh, a pop. Nope. How easy was was your pop Warner coach's job coaching <laughs> you in, in pop Warner football against guys like me and Bill? Uh, yeah. I mean. We ran a sweep, we ran yeah. a reverse, and we never threw the ball. 36 rocket to Dominique. <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to do, we're going to get 18 pop, yards of pop. Yeah, yeah we, we was getting some explosives out there every now and then. All right, All let's right. start the show. All right, guys. <laughs> I got a new game for us. Oh, oh no. Bill. Oh. Bill. Man loves the game. This game, uh, we're going to get through all the NFL stuff, but this, this segment, it's called, You Sure About That? You Really Sure About That? Oh God! I try. I tried just to give him this the cold no laugh, so he would be uncomfortable. I'm not, but I'm he, not. he was so he was so excited. This about is it. a I good. Can't. This is a good segment. All right, here we go. Are we sure the Vikings? Okay, let me answer the context. This the Vikings are up twenty eight to nothing at halftime. I had a I had a text written to both of you being like, should we view the Vikings as the best team in the NFL above the Chiefs, above ever above everyone? They ended up uh, winning that game by the skin of their teeth, thirty one to twenty nine. You sure about that? Are we sure the Vikings should feel good about their win today over the Packers? I'm absolutely sure that they should feel good about their win over the Packers. I think that what they do not feel good about, I think, is you're right. They were on the verge of having another dominating win, and then we have to consider them uh, as the best team in football. So maybe they're a little disappointed about that. But like they played throughout the course of this game. The game script changed, and the what was expected of them changed, and they seemed to step up at every moment. It wasn't as if uh, they didn't force turnover after turnover after turnover. So if teams are going to get uh, explosive plays and lots of yards, that means they're going to put the ball at risk, and this team is getting pressure on the passer, and their DBs are making plays on the ball. So I don't think you get one without the other. One without the other. If the game ends and they have zero turnovers and four touchdowns, that's one story, but they – just kept getting Picked the ball off back, love so. three times. Yeah, it, it feels to me like it's a it's a trade off that if teams are going to be aggressive against them, most of the time they're going to end up having to pay for it also, and they're going to get some plays because it's the NFL. Yeah, it's the NFL, but frankly, I don't really think the Vikings will look back on the second half of this game as anything they can feel good about. And I understand they won. They had to survive a drop kick at the end of the game, which, speaking of 1950s football, uh, I feel like we rolled some stuff out there from the same coach who was running the single wing earlier this season with Malik Willis. But I, I know you guys earlier this week brought Mina Kimes on to talk about the Vikings and their scheme and all that stuff. Dominique took a deep dive. The show became an Exodus and O show very briefly, when, of course, the Sunday night, this is the vibe show before Monday. <laughs> this was a situation where it felt like the Vikings should have kept dominating this game, right? They get an early mm -hmm. lead. We know you want to, if the Vikings get an early lead, Sam Darnold doesn't have to drop back and pass. They can run the ball. They can use play action. They can do all the things they want to do on offense. And then Brian Flores can roll out all those exotics on defense. And early in this game, the Vikings were winning up front with that pass, which, which I think is kind of the underrated story here. I think Dominique mm -hmm. talked about this on Thursday. This yeah. idea that, like, you know, it's not just smoke and mirrors. They're winning up front a lot, and that's allowing them to be in third and long and then pull out all those smoke and mirrors. But the problem is the pass rush got tired because the Packers had the ball over and over and over in this game because the Vikings couldn't get anything going on offense. Mm -hmm. And once the pass rush got tired, all that Brian Flores magic did not seem to hold up all that well. They only really got stops when they turned the ball over or when they, for they forced turnovers from the Packers. So that's fine, I guess, but I just felt like there were 
more opportunities for the Packers, and they found more solutions than other teams have yeah. against this Brian Flores defense the first few weeks of the year because they were able to hold up pass protection in the second half because there wasn't as much pressure on Jordan Love. And that would be my concern because when you play teams with better offensive lines, maybe you're not going to be able to get away with all the stuff you've been getting away with uh, the first few weeks of the year. Yeah, I think it's fair, but I think one of the things that you said that I think is really important is we've been talking about this team a lot about being kind of a defensive led unit and discrediting uh, Sam Darnold. But we did see, to your point, when their offense sputtered, the defense is not could not show the ability just to be completely locked down, shut out defense in this particular game. So. I don't want to like over extrapolate from one particular game because they have been shutting people down. But I do think that that mattered early in the game. It was like the offense created turnovers or created three and outs or excuse me, the defense created turnovers or three and outs. And then the offense took the ball and held it and then went and scored touchdown. Yes. I think they were up 21 zero at one point. And that's a whole different 28 zero 28 zero. Yeah. There's a, that's a whole different way to play the game. Yeah, they were also up to a good point. That's a whole different way to play the game than in the second half. But the one pushback I will have against what you said, Bill, and I guess it's fair. It doesn't always work out that you'll get turnovers. But it wasn't – at least the Byron Murphy pick is the one that, that jumps out to my mind. Is mm -hmm. that still a reaction to – what a, that specific play was an all out blitz mm -hmm. and it's still a reaction to what they are doing defensively. So yeah, it's not going to work every time. And I think that was the point I was trying to make off the top is some of the times it's not going to work and they're going to move the ball and have some success. But if you keep doing it and the DBs are as smart and disciplined as they've been up into this season, they're going to give you some chances and that's all you really want in, in the back end. I think the bigger, uh, to me, it wasn't about the defense allowing the 29 points in the second half. It's what Bill said. It's the fact that in t until we see it for an entire season, we're going to have questions. I know Bill's a sympathizer, but about the Sam Darnold-led offense That's when it really matters. And they were a completely different team offensively and defensively, or offensively from the first half to the second half. And I'm sure that's partially game strip dependent. They took their foot off the gas. But that still has to be concerning because... This is a team. This is the type of quality opponent they're gonna they're gonna play in meaningful postseason games. And Darnold had two turnovers in the second half. And that's a big deal for a team that wants as now has Super Bowl aspirations. There's a lot of credibility that we extend to teams that we've seen have a certain amount of success, which I think is well deserved. And we do discount teams that haven't done it over the course of a couple seasons. And sometimes that's just our personal bias getting in the way. And we'll say about those teams, which I'm guilty of this, particularly last year, beginning of this year, I started to say, you know what? I think the Eagles aren't good. But last year when they were getting all those one score games wins and we were all like, but they're the Eagles. We all fell into that trap and we're unwilling to accept. Actually, they're not good. Mm -hmm. Just because those, the names are the same. They're, they're playing poorly now. So I'm thinking when we're looking at this Vikings game, we're, we're used to saying that they aren't good and same about Sam Darnold and we're, waiting for a chance to be like hey you're not good because if this was another team if this was the 49ers pulling this win off we'd say hey they all aren't going to be pretty they're lucky to have a win you pulled this one out this is what tough gritty teams do and I'm concerned that it just it skews the way that we look at this and trying to be honest in the way that we watch this team they've been so freaking impressive all season long they slipped up in the second half of this oh, game Doesn't I know, mean I know that. what's going on what Bill, do you know what's going on? How come you never just listen to me? You, you, uh, you're always psychoanalyzing. Just listen to what I'm saying. Maybe what I'm saying is a thing. It's not a something that's going on. No, no, no. Maybe no. I, this, this is, is honest this is, analysis. This is, a Bill. this is a Ravens fan speaking. Oh, this team's so oh. good all season long. Oh, we almost blew a 30 point lead. Oh. Uh, but it's not that big a deal because we've been go so good all season long. It's not at all that. Some Bill. copium. Some Ravens copium coming through. <laughs> it's nothing to do with the Ravens. Nothing to do with you the Ravens. You got hit by the therapist, Charlie Kravitz, with that one. <laughs> this is I, I know this about Charlie. Is While he's listening to me, he's always looking. He's not listening to what I'm saying. He's trying to get some deeper meaning. When actually, I'm just talking about confirmation bias. It's a simple thing. All you had to say was like, yeah, Dominic, you're right. Confirmation bias is a thing. We should be aware of that. Thank this you. Is, no one loves this team almost blowing 30-point leads more than Dominic Fox. <laughs> when did the Ravens become purple, my team? This purple team. <laughs> you had team. two teams, the Ravens and the Cowboys. Uh, I'd only played for one of them and grew up in Baltimore. So but far. Still not my team. So <laughs> yeah, far. so far. Um, yeah, Dak might need me. I... <laughs> brother you might need you it's right i i don't i don't disagree with any of that but i do think like we're talking about this in a binary term and i know dominique you're not like 
thinking about it that way necessarily, but I think there's this thing of like, oh, is Sam Darnold fixed? Is he different? Or is he mm-hmm. just the same old Sam Darnold? Like multiple things can be true here. Sam Darnold can be better than the guy we've seen before. He can still be putting the ball into danger too often. And he can be doing that in game scripts that really play to his strengths. Like he has not had to be in a situation where he's had to throw from behind. They trailed for, they fumbled on the 10 yard line on their opening drive of week one against the Giants. And then they scored like 174 consecutive points to blow them out. And they have not trailed in any game since then. And that is still my concern with Sam Darnold because even though he has not had crazy turnover rates so far this season, he's put the ball in danger. He has been generally pretty lucky when it comes to avoiding interceptions. And we saw a couple of turnovers in this game. There could have been, I think, one or two more based on what I saw. I want to go back and watch it again. But like this is a quarterback where I don't believe he's really dramatically different. I think he's yeah. a little better. But I think most of what we've seen so far, I, I don't really disagree with I don't really agree with Dominique. I don't think that he's that we're just counting this out. I think when you actually watch him play, he's making mistakes. He's doing the same sort of right. questionable decisions that he's done in the past. He just has a lot more leeway because he's playing from ahead. I think listening to you makes me realize that the lesson that I should have learned or that I that I am actually talking about is not about the Vikings. It's not that we are treating the Vikings unfairly. It's that we need to be honest about the teams that do stink and 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 have the positive confirmation bias, right? Hmm. What team could Dominique be talking about here? <laughs> I don't know. We'll get to it when we get to it, I guess. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't know. Why ask me? Ask Charlie, because he can read my mind all the time. Apparently, he knows. <laughs> oh exactly man, what I heard. I, mean. it, I heard his feelings. It's... Out of Mordor. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, I think Bill Bill raises the real question with this. It's not really a Sam Darnold. Is he good or is he bad? It's like this team specific, this scheme specific. Can he be good enough to take this team deep in the playoffs? Because the scheme is amazing on both sides of the ball, and they have all this talent. And to me, that's like. That's the conversation where where he fits into it with the player we know he is. Right. I mean, he has the arm talent to make the throws. I think that's yes. what it comes down to is when we talk about any quarterback, we say, like, there's going to be, even the ones who we consider game managers, there's going to be, there's going to come a moment, particularly in a single elimination portion of the season, where the scheme can't help you, the defense isn't going to save you, you're going to have to make some throws. He has the arm talent to make those throws. Does he have the brain power to not make the uh the bad throws and i think that's it kind of feels like honestly we want it to bill's point we want it to be a binary and it's not binary like i think i know sam Darnold can make those throws but i also know sam Darnold can throw it to the other team it's not we'll, we'll see what happens when we get there there's nothing he's done so far this season that makes me feel definitively one way or the other okay I, I know that I wanted to make a nuanced point. Now I want to make a dumb point, and I want you guys yeah, to Yeah, that's me on what this we're ride. here for. Say it with that's your chest, Bill. This is the vibe show. Okay, so on the Kyle Shanahan slash Kyle Shanahan, Sean McVay tree of quarterbacks, where does Sam Donald fall through four Ooh. games? Is he up there with Brock Purdy? Is he in the Jimmy G zone? Are we talking Tua? Are you bringing up Matthew mm. Stafford? Are you talking about good Jared Goff, bad Jared Goff? Where? Where, where does Sam Darnold stand for you in terms of getting help from the scheme and the superstar receiver he has to work with? Uh, where are we going to be talking about him uh, I mean, three months from now? Right right now, I think it's impossible to take him out of the um, Jimmy Garoppolo no, zone. Dominic. What? The, 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 uh, so, okay, you were going to actually, sorry, I made a mistake. You were giving an answer. I thought you were going to do the, ah, oh, well, it was too early to say. I, I thought we were no, getting saying, Dominique get, Foxworth show, but I, we were getting actually get up Dominique Foxworth, which is exactly what I want. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm, oh, yeah, I'm giving you the hot takes. This is Thank you. Tuesday, Wednesday, Fox. So um, it's impossible to take him out of Jimmy Garoppolo's zone right now, given what he's seen. Mm-hmm. He's Jimmy garoppolo it. He's been in these positive game scripts and had things schemed up for him. I think the arm talent is better than Jimmy Garoppolo, so that – makes us feel because we see some of the throws and Mm -hmm. there are highlight level throws. So then we're like, Oh, this is a highlight level quarterback, but we haven't seen him in those moments. The same way we've seen Purdy actually make those big plays in the playoffs and in tight games, make those big throws over the middle when they need to be made. Mm -hmm. Darnold hasn't done that yet. So he's, he's on the Garoppolo rung, I think right now. Right. If only we had an expert on quarterback tiers, we could, we could Mm -hmm. consult on this topic. So I'm going to call him uh He's sort of just supercharged Kirk Cousins in every single way, <laughs> which is interceptions in the worst moments of all time, Ugh. but to a way more extreme um, level than Kirk. Bill, give but he can make more th- he can make more throws than Jimmy G. That's, that's why I can't answer. do that. Like he's yeah. got legitimate arms. So I guess that yeah, there's, that's different. 
Yeah, I mean, I think he's in the same spot, but he's gotten there in a different way. But Bill will tell us the right answer. I'm going to go. I'm, I'm, I, I wanted to be thoughtful. I, mm -hmm. It's important to give an accurate answer. I would say he is in, halfway between good Jared Goff and bad Jared Goff. He is average Jared Goff in this <laughs> offense. Like He can make like all the throws. Sometimes you don't know where the ball's going. Sometimes he doesn't know where the ball's going. I don't want to see him play from behind. There's going to be a game this year where he's like two of 11 with three picks, and he's going to have to move past that. But, I mean, overall, Jared to be Goff clear, made to the Super to Bowl. To be clear, you didn't say it with your chest. You, you, no, you're halfway between golfs, and it's not fair. If you're listening to this episode, tweet at the three of us. Let us know. Is he Jimmy Garoppolo, who looks like a Lego character? Is he face mash Jared Goff? Or is he Wario Kirk Cousins? Because those, the, those are the three options we came to. All right, let's move on to the next. Uh, you sure about that? Oh. Um, let's talk Eagles Bucks. The Bucks Ooh. offense rolled the Eagles defense that we thought they figured something out against uh, the Saints when Jalen Carter went nuts last week. And the Eagles offense was completely inept in the first half. Are we sure that Jalen Hurts is good? That's my question coming out of this <laughs> wow. game. Wow. The Eagles aren't by next week. Then they should get A.J., uh, Devontae Smith, and Lane, Lane Johnson back. Yeah, that, that, that feels like an important context to add here, Charlie. The Eagles' I added leading it. receiver <laughs> in this game after Dallas Goddard was – could you know? Can, can either of you uh, uh, give us the answer to this question? No, 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 no shot. Who you got? It was it was Paris Campbell who had Ooh. four catches for seventeen yards and a touchdown. Colts legend. Paris Campbell, Colts legend. Um, I, I mean, like, would anybody have succeeded in this scenario? It was not just no AJ Brown, no Devontae Smith, but no Lane Johnson. Um, so down your excellent starting right tackle, where every quarterback in seemingly the entire Howie Roseman era has played dramatically worse without Lane Johnson in the lineup. I mean, I don't think Jalen Hurts played well in this game, but I don't know that anybody would have looked good in this game. Well, I mean, I think the question, you only take the question seriously if we take into account the last season and the early sure. portions of this season. Like, this one game is not enough to for us to formulate that, are we sure about that? But I think uh, the reason why it's a question is he hasn't been good s since that uh, Super Bowl run season. So... And he's had all of these parts. The only, I feel like, spark that they have on the offense right now, and it's because of injury, but even when everyone's healthy, Saquon is special in this offense, and everything else is concerning. So the Eagles system, or I guess the Eagles' success recently, has been largely based on winning up front on offensive line and defensive line. And they've been inconsistent. The defensive line was not getting pressure in this game, and it compromised their defense. And not having Lane Johnson on the offensive line is obviously makes things a lot more difficult, especially when you don't have any of your playmakers. But I think the question about Jalen Hurts is, no, we're not sure. We, I, I think it's hard to say that we're sure that he's good, given – uh, I think we're sure that he's not as good as we thought he'd be. Uh, I at least was projecting based on that yeah. Super Bowl season that he would continue to get better, and he has not. You could argue that he stayed around the same and circumstances around him had gotten tougher, but I think being honest, he's gotten worse. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's it's sad, but I think to your game, are we sure? No, we're not sure that he is – Good. That's the question, right? Good. Yeah. Are we sure he's good? I mean, look, there's there's more to this, too. An additional context. They were down 21 nothing in this game. Um, in the first half, there was a point where the Bucs had 186 total yards. The Eagles had zero. The Bucs had 10 first downs. The Eagles had zero. Uh, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that's it? Yeah. Quarter, good quarterbacks <laughs> don't have that. <laughs> I imagine we could find some stretches in all good quarterbacks' careers that are pretty bad. But uh, I think the the totality of the last season and a half for him has been pretty rocky, and that's the concern. 12 games in a row with at least one turnover. Mahomes turns the ball over like twice a week. It doesn't seem to matter for the Chiefs. They just win anyway. So, like, I don't see that. That, that, that doesn't bother me. I, I just think, to Dominique's point, when he played in that Super Bowl, that entire year, but especially in the Super Bowl, he was the best player on the field in that game mm -hmm. besides Chris Jones. Like, he was the best offensive player. He was better than Mahomes. Mm -hmm. He was the best offensive player in the game, and he drove the Eagles offense. Like, he was the – he got help from the offensive line, of course. He had help from his receivers, but he was the driving force of that offense. 
And now what's changed is that it seems like he slipped into this zone where he needs help. Like it can't just be him. It can't just be him in the quarterback run game. It can't just be him, you know, making stuff happen out of structure. Like he needs guys to get open. You see so many times in this offense, even when they had AJ Brown and Devontae Smith over the first few weeks of the year, he dropped back to pass and there would just be nothing happening. He would just be standing there waiting for someone to get open. And at some point, you know, I, I've gone back and watched a little bit. I don't think I've I've seen every single pass he's thrown, but like guys are are open here and there. Like it's not like nobody's open. Um, that to me is the concern because you, you're talking about a guy who transcended. He he was the scheme. He was the system mm-hmm. for the Eagles, and now it feels like he has to thrive within a, another system. Now that they hired Kellen Moore, but like it feels like we were expecting. Oh, if they just fix the stuff against the blitz, he'll be fine. And they fix the stuff against the blitz, and it doesn't feel like he's fine and yeah. you see a real like inconsistency with this offense i mean even in the first game even in the packers game they won they turned the ball over twice to start the game they look dominant for three drives they struggle for a bit like this offense any single possession they can come out and look like the 2022 eagles or they can look like the second half of the 2023 eagles and i don't really know which is coming yeah and and jalen more often i feel like looks like the bad version of that oftentimes and while lane johnson was out this game i of the Jalen that I've watched this season, I, the thing that's most alarming to me is he's in clean pockets and yeah. no one's running wide open. But like it's NFL, like you read the coverage, anticipate, and throw, and he's not throwing the ball and he's not feeling comfortable. It's like he's trying to avoid a turnover or he's trying to buy time to make a big play, and it and the big plays never come and the turnovers haven't stopped. So yeah. it, it feels like he's ending up the worst of all worlds where it felt like that that season that great season he was a lot more decisive the rpo was i guess mm-hmm. more in vogue and more effective and he was making quick decisions and you're right he was he was point guard in that whole offense and it seemed really fluid and then when things weren't working out he would make something happen yeah and it's not that he's like bad it's just disappointing when a player who you think is going to ascend into that tier of quarterbacks you can it like elevate an offense takes that step mm-hmm. backwards to be like we don't know what we have here i mean to your point about lane johnson though of how important that guy is, Bill. Uh, since 2013, the Eagles are 97, 59, and 1 in the 157 games he's played. Mm-hmm. 14 and 28 when he doesn't play. It's a big difference. Quarterback or wins, not a quarterback stat, is a right tackle stat. <laughs> yep. You start with the right tackle, you build around that. I mean, like, we've seen quarterbacks dip. I mean, Lamar, after his MVP year, wasn't as good of a player for a couple of years and then came back and won another MVP. I mean, are you... Based on what you're seeing, do you feel like that MVP caliber season for him was a mirage? Or do you feel like it was just like natural fluctuations and he has to get back to that point and there's something that has to change about his play to get him back there? I mean, it definitely wasn't a mirage and the skills that he had um, aren't gone. Just hasn't been implementing it, I guess. That's the scary part is it's not a bad stretch anymore. Like it's been relative to how high his highs were it's been more consistently mediocre to below average and that's the concerning part because it'd be last year we chalked it up to injury right Mm -hmm. and this year we haven't gotten any whispers that he's hurt and so it's hard to figure out what we can blame it on this year if it's not just that he's taken some sort of uh regression step the weird part and maybe the part that's most frustrating for me is you think about what's happening league wide on defense. Everybody is upset because teams are playing too high shells and they're taking away the big plays and they're, you know, they're limiting what you can do. If any team on paper would be built to beat that stuff, right. it's the Philadelphia Eagles with the great offensive line and dominate light boxes with Jalen Hurts, with Saquon Barkley, with two guys, AJ Brown and Devontae Smith, who can beat any coverage, who can win against man coverage, who can win one on one. It would feel like they would have the pieces to do that. And yet it feels like they're getting worse as the, it feels like they're just entirely dependent on Saquon so far this season. Yeah. Saquon's been incredible. Like I, they, He's they, great. They would, Saquon's they would not be, the issue. Yeah. But when you fall behind 17, nothing, you get 10 carries from Saquon in the game and he might go for 84 yards on those 10 carries, but it don't matter. Yeah. It's not enough. Yeah. I mean, worth noting just to put a, bu- a button on the Jalen Hurts stuff. It's, it's also tough that this happened against a Bucks team that last week, Bo Nix looked competent against, and then this week Bo Nix had sixty negative seven yards in the first half against the Jets. Um, and it, 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 it could have been even worse. I mean, the Bucks dropped a wide open touchdown that would have put them up, I think, twenty four nothing. They mm-hmm. they were they could do whatever they wanted. And as much as Jalen Hurts is frustrating, this defense 
like I understand they looked good last week. They seem to have that 6-1 front going against the outside zone with Kubiak and felt like they could go back to what worked for Fangio four years ago. But they looked absolutely hopeless. And the names are there, but this pass rush sucks. And it is like one week against the Saints with injured offensive linemen is not convincing me that that is the likeliest scenario. This defense yeah. is in bad three out of the first four weeks of the year. All right, guys, it's time. It's time for the check-in presented by Allstate. Today we're checking in on my beloved Washington Commanders and our <laughs> franchise quarterback, Jaden Daniels, who has, uh, we finally punted. That sucks. <laughs> but uh, it was a dominant performance uh, in a revenge game for Cliff Kingsbury against uh, Kyler Murray, who was also having a revenge game against Cliff Kingsbury, the double <laughs> revenge game against each other. Commanders won 42-14. Um, 40 burger on the board, unstoppable offense punted for the first time in a fortnight. <laughs> Are we sure the commanders can't win the NFC East? You sure about that? <sighs> Let's not get careful. It's our check-in. It's, um, it's hilarious, Bill, to be around Charlie right now because I've only known Charlie since he had little to no faith in his <laughs> commander's team. Uh, since over the three different names that they've had since I've met Charlie, he we would watch games together and they'd be up by uh, 10 points going into fourth quarter and he's like, they're going to blow it. Inevitably, they would blow it. Now, they're playing in games and Charlie's excited and expects them to win. It's the most ridiculous thing ever. It's all Jaden Daniels. He's changed the person <laughs> that I host the show with. I don't even know this man. We got him. <laughs> we got him. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. <laughs> Char- Charlie was on the like the UT message boards, oh, grinding yeah. Arch Manning's, uh, you know, burner Instagram three weeks ago, and now <laughs> now he's like, remember remember when Robert Griffin had that great first year? Oh, and he yeah. got married at the end of the year, and there was like a thing in the newspaper about how people were sending him gifts for his wedding, and like two <laughs> years later they wanted him out of town. I feel like we're already in the sending <sighs> Jaden Daniels gift for his wedding. Uh, element of Washington falling in love with their quarterback. Whatever you need, Jaden. <laughs> I mean, the the question. It, look, the only remaining as we we're we're putting the card in front of the horse here. We should talk about this game a little bit. But it's about the questions are always about durability with him because he was yeah. taking so many shots at the beginning of the season, now protecting himself, and he's still like, it's crazy seeing him on an NFL field how skinny he looks, yeah, um, and that's concerning. But I mean, he the his performance in week three. Almost impossible to repeat. That was like a perfect game. But to come out this week and move the ball so effectively, even if it's against a Cardinals defense that is um, not elite, I think it's fair to say, <laughs> yeah, uh, non-elite defense. I mean, he looked excellent again. And he, he and the running game is incredible around him because of the threat that he has. And he's willing to drive the ball downfield. Um, and he's made Cliff's horizontal air raid work. He spread the ball out. You talking about uh, the only question is, uh, can he stay healthy, is that's – Incredible, because that means that to you, all the other questions have been answered, which actually are the yeah, hardest he's questions. Good at football, mm-hmm. yeah. Which people don't, you know how this works. We people are still debating whether you should re-sign veteran quarterbacks that have been the Pro Bowl year after year. So, like, it takes a, a long it. time to get to a point where shut up, Bill. It takes a long time to get to a point where people believe in their quarterback. You're four weeks in, and you already know that you got the guy. What's so funny, Bill? Ah, just just being told to shut up. I love that. That's, that's why I love to be on on the show as a guest <laughs> on a podcast. No, you're right. You're, shut up you're on right my though. podcast. No, because he was making faces, and I knew what he was thinking, and I didn't like it. You didn't hear what I said, did you? No, uh, I did. No, I said ty- Pro Bowl was like Tyler Huntley starting. Oh, oh Huntley yeah, Dolphins. that's my bad. Snoop. No, yeah, no, you're right. Snoop. You're right, though. I mean, it it speaks to how quickly this is turned around, and that is a rare thing. I mean, we did not see this very often with rookie quarterbacks. And the one guy we saw this with very recently mm-hmm. that comes to mind for me is C.J. Stroud, where mm-hmm. with C.J. Stroud, week one, he was bad against the Braves. Not bad, but he was just wasn't anything special against the Ravens. And by like week five, we were like, oh, no, they, they are good. And then they won the division. And right. that would have seemed incredibly shocking this time a year ago. And by the end of the year, it seemed totally natural and normal. I, I, I don't think we can rule out that possibility by any means i think they're absolutely in the race there's no reason to think the cowboys are a great football team they just lost micah parsons and demarcus lawrence for the next month their defense was not good with those guys on the field their offense no disrespect to to our our uh beloved dak prescott but offense does not look good so far they can't win the football um the giants are bad 
the Eagles, we just talked about how messy they are. Like the commanders have been the best team in this division through four games. And Charlie, the thing you mentioned about Jaden Daniels is his need to stay healthy. Of course, he has to protect himself. We've seen him slide a little bit more, yeah. but what's important to me is I, I contrast him to someone like Anthony Richardson, where Anthony Richardson got hurt today in that Colts game, injured his hip. Thankfully, seems like a minor injury. But with Anthony Richardson, I don't think he can succeed right now as an NFL quarterback consistently without the threat of the quarterback run game. Like He has to be involved between the tackles as a runner to get that offense to work. Jaden Daniels, yes, they have him running a little bit, but a lot of what he's running is stuff where he's protected. He has a lead blocker. He has the ability to get outside, go out of bounds. He's scrambling. Like, yes, he's running some design quarterback runs where he's taking hits near the goal line, but he's thriving as a pure passer. Yeah. He does not need that stuff to work. It's going to help. Helps any quarterback who can pull it off, but he's thriving strictly as a quarterback, and that other stuff is gravy, and that is, to me, the big difference here because if they just decide in week 10 hey you've taken too many hits we're not running you anymore like it's going to be you know uh one, one or two times the rest of the year and that's it only when we absolutely need it he'll be fine that, that's because he's so impressive as a pure quarterback as a pure thrower in the pocket no it's it's stark he's so much more developed than we realized i mean i think we can all agree our draft takes would be a lot better if we got to see four games <laughs> of nfl football before <laughs> before giving them okay no, that, that, that's actually a good. That's a good point, though. Now we've seen four games of Caleb Williams. We're, we're getting there for sure. Hold on, before we get there, okay. You guys don't want to apply any context to this that you apply to most of the other conversations, though. Like the, no, about the defenses that he's oh, no, definitely, definitely. definitely. Oh, no, about the about the defenses that he's going up against. No, there, there's there's huge parts of that. That's a, the Cardinals defense was is terrible, and yeah. so is the Bengals. Yeah, yeah. I mean the Bengals. Yeah, um, I mean, and the the Commanders' offense though is been really excellent like epa per play they're even ahead of the bills they're the best offense by epa in the league and they're have the worst defensive epa in the league like <laughs> historically bad secondary yeah. like they're you know the first through the first three weeks they only forced three punts um as well so it's like yeah there, there's definitely co context but if we get to the caleb williams part about it like he was supposed to have the best situation ever for a first overall pick quarterback mm. and they've played the colts and rams defenses and he has barely flashed, if you could even say that, against those yeah. teams. And so, like, it, yeah, of course who you play matters, but yeah. how you play also is a huge factor of it. And I, I want to ask you, based on these four games and everything else you knew about them before the draft, I feel like, you know, I, I can't speak to you guys. I felt like most of the people I spoke to, at least what I thought about as someone who knows nothing about the draft, felt pretty comfortable saying Caleb Williams should be the first overall pick, Jaden Daniels should be the second overall pick. Are you comfortable having seen enough from the first four weeks to flip that where you feel like there's a significantly better chance Jada Daniels turns out to be a better pro quarterback than Caleb Williams? Uh, I mean, it's impossible not to, <laughs> given what we've seen so far. We haven't seen uh, quality. We haven't even seen uh, – one thing that I thought we would definitely see is more big play splashes. I thought worst-case mm -hmm. scenario for Caleb was he'd be sloppy but exciting like uh, how we used to talk about Josh Allen. It's like, all right, mm -hmm. he's going to give them the ball because he's going to try to do some stuff that no one else is trying to do. But every now and then, those things are going to work. Like We haven't even gotten that from Caleb. And the thing about the best situation has been – it's been turned on his head because we all got fell in love with the what was happening in Chicago when got to protect your quarterback. You got to be able to run the ball. These are things that make life easier for a quarterback, no matter how many great weapons they have out on the outside and they haven't been able to protect him or support him with the running game. These are things that Jaden Daniels is getting. He is getting protection and they do have a good running game. They don't have much of a defense, but slightly different. I'm going to, I'm going to give you some, some analytics for this, some, mm -hmm. some PFF grades Ooh. and EPA grades through the first three <laughs> weeks PFF uh, grades. I don't know if he qualifies. Char analytics. Char yeah, Char Char Charlie just, just went to chat GPT and it was like, give me every Jaden Daniels stat you have. <laughs> and this is a Caleb Williams stat. Okay. Um, okay. But through the first three weeks of his career, when you do the cross section of EPA per play and his PFF offensive grade, uh, this is from Kevin Cole. Um, his stats are in line with Bryce Young last year, Trevor Lawrence under Urban Meyer. Matt Stafford on those really, really dysfunctional Lions teams, Davis Mills, Brandon Whedon, Jameis Winston, Justin Fields, Zach Wilson. Those are the people in his phylum of quarterback through three weeks. And so, yeah, it's a small sample, of course, 
Um, but they were those guys. I think we would all say were in worse situations that Caleb was dropped into. Um, yeah, Shane Waldron's probably not a good offensive coordinator, but we were saying the same things about Cliff Kingsbury before the season. Sure. If you were to say it now, yeah, I think it would be impossible not to say that currently, if you're looking at it, Jaden Daniels is a significant step up as a prospect from Caleb Williams. Yeah, I think you. I agree, Bill. Yeah, I think we're good. <laughs> all right. Argument one. We aren't arguing. <laughs> <laughs> there was no argument to have. We were having a conversation. That's right. <laughs> Char- Char- Charlie's just claiming dubs wherever he can get them. Yeah. The commanders win three uh, games in a row, and Charlie is just walking around town. Just just gets on the metro and the- shows up. He's like, oh, just dub for Charlie. You should uh, you should see my, uh, you know, when you go to an iPhone, you can, like, if you go to the GIF thing, you can look at your most oh. recent search GIFs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's all different. We got them GIFs. <laughs> It's the it's the Drewski. We we fucking got him. It's the it's the ladies and gentlemen. We got him. Oh. It's the Gadim. It's all the different ones. <laughs> the next, you sure about that? You're gonna talk about uh, prodigy rookie quarterbacks. Well, the Texans team was not even a dark horse Super Bowl contender. Some people mm-hmm. just thought that they were gonna be one of the best teams in the NFL. Um, they have an offense that. Loves to establish the run for about two yards in a cloud of dust or two yards a pop. <laughs> two yards a pop out there. Uh, of course, CJ Stroud has still been been very good. Um, yeah, that's... people looking at the tape think that. And Nico Collins mm-hmm. on pace for over two thousand receiving yards. He's emerged as an, uh, as an elite weapon. But are we sure the Texans have an elite offense? Well, we're sure that they don't right now. Like the the stats make it clear that they do not. I'm not I'm not overly concerned about the. I mean, I guess your point about their rushing attack dying, that was a core p- portion of what they mm-hmm. did last year. That is concerning going forward. But what we've seen from C.J. Stroud, at least I watched a ton of him because I did that Vikings thing. And while his numbers weren't good in that Vikings game, I felt like he was in control of that situation. And I had no concerns about C.J. Stroud. And you have Nico Collins, a great receiver, and Diggs is making plays yeah. right now, a good receiver too. So, like, I, I'm hesitant to say that they'll get back to, like, some elite status because the rushing game is gone, but I'm not concerned about this team ceiling because of how good C.J. Stroud is and how comfortable he looks even in terrible situations. They're 3-1, and one and they did beat the Jaguars today yeah. to make uh, uh, 24-20 to send the Jaguars to 0-4. <laughs> Well, as someone who picked the Jaguars to make the playoffs over the Texans, I feel like I'm a very authoritative person to give my <laughs> thoughts here. But like the concerns we had about the Texans are legit. I mean, this was a team where people were plugging in, oh, we're going to get the best Joe Mixon, we're going to get the best Stephon Diggs. Like, how could this go wrong? Well, like this is team, still a team that wants to run the ball, and their offensive line has been terrible. They've had multiple games where either Larry Tunsil, who left this game injured, I think it was Kenyon Green today, like just got tons of penalties like we're getting booed by the fans um you're being stuck in third and long all these times and yes cj stroud is incredible and can make plays on third and long here and there but nobody wants to live in that that world that's not a place where you're going to thrive even if you're patrick mahomes and this offense last year you know we our memory of this offense is the browns playoff game and yeah. it was not like that every week. I would love to say it was. Their their ceiling was incredible. Their ceiling now, now is incredible. They could score 40 points next week, and it wouldn't shock anybody. But that's not what they were on a week-to-week basis. They were a pretty run-heavy team. They did want to take a lot of the pressure off of Stroud. They did not want to put him, if they could avoid it, in, in obvious dropback situations. And he spent too much time this year in those obvious dropback situations. The fact that he's been able to do anything in those moments, to me, speaks to his talent. But... This is still a team that wants to run the ball, and right. their offensive line's not playing well enough to do it. Their running backs have not been good enough. They miss Joe Mixon, who's hurt. I don't know if he's going to come back at 100%, but they they, they they feel like they're stuck between the offense that everyone wants them to be and the offense they want to be, and they're not really thriving in either right now. That's a fair um, assessment of last year, and I think everything we did last year was us compensating for being very wrong about them and also sure. grading them. Yeah, and also grading them on a curve because they had a rookie mm-hmm. quarterback and we expected them to stink. And sure. they were not like the best offense in football, and they were a run heavy offense. And now this year, it feels like a lot more pressure on Slowick now because when you have a quarterback that's as top of the league good, which CJ Stroud is yeah. that good, and you have 
a top level left tackle and when he's healthy at least and you have a true number one which Nico Collins is mm -hmm. like I, I'm gonna need something out of you slow like we gotta <laughs> find a way to make this work uh, because you are getting two yards a pop, that is not a good enough excuse. The offense needs to evolve, and they have the time to evolve because they are three and one, despite the fact that they're not playing yes. incredibly well on offense. So I'm not. That's I guess that's why I'm not concerned is because they have what we think of as one of these young, talented coordinators. Which we could be wrong about that. This could be all C.J. Stroud induced uh, success, mm -hmm. but. We have somebody who we think is good. We have a great quarterback, and we have playmakers. There is a version of this offense that should be effective, and it, sometimes it takes time to find it, and maybe they'll find it at some point. How much do you think they miss, miss Tank Dell? Why do you ask that question? Just because we know Nico Collins can sort of win anywhere, but there was sort of the mind meld with um, CJ Stroud and Tank Dell as okay. like a legitimate explosive second option. And, and yeah, Diggs, think Stephon Diggs. He's 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 making plays, but he's not that type of receiver. Right. He's not that same type of explosives guy that that mm -hmm. Dell is at this stage of his career. I mean, they they went on to be productive without him last year. I don't. Uh, I think the impact on the rushing game is more important than the absence of Tank Dell. Having more weapons is probably always better. Yeah. So I guess mm -hmm. they miss him some, but I don't think that the switch on this offense is Tank Dell coming back. That's my problem is, is Bobby Slowick didn't have answers last week when they played Minnesota. Like they did not right. find solutions as the game went along. They just tried the same right. stuff and got blown up over yep. and over and over again and got stuck in third and long. And to be fair, Tunsil couldn't stop committing penalties, but um, <laughs> got stuck in third and long over and over again all game. And now we're seeing some adversity and we're seeing that the offense right now is not them creating lots of easy completions for CJ Stroud, but CJ Stroud and Nico Collins being incredible football players and succeeding despite the offense. I want to mm -hmm. see what answers they come up with to get the running game back going, to get Tank Dell integrated when he comes back, to actually have an offense that is creating those easy plays for CJ Stroud. I haven't had a chance to go through this um, Jags game the way that I did the Vikings game, but one of the things sure. that jumped out to me that was concerning about the Vikings, the game, uh, about the um, Texans' performance in the Vikings game was not only did they not develop answers as the game went along they tried some of the answers that the 49ers used the week prior that didn't work like they ran some of the exact same zone beating plays that the Vikings were designed to induce and then drop into and they were like hey that's what Kyle wanted to do so we're gonna do it too so that was disappointing all right we got a couple more the Chiefs today um they had uh, an interesting day we had an explosive Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> we had an explosive Patrick Mahomes 54-yard touchdown pass to Xavier Worthy, which was the longest touchdown pass he's had since 2022. They're also mm -hmm. down 10 nothing against the Chargers team with the hobble Herbert. Um, shout out to the Ringer <laughs> Fantasy Football Show for say, for getting that stuck in my head. Hobbled Herbert. Oh. Um, <laughs> Patrick Mahomes uh, tore Rasheed Rice's ACL with a vicious hit on an interception that Patrick Mahomes threw. And this is going to beg the question for me because we've seen these periods where Patrick Mahomes in this offense haven't been as explosive as they were in the Tyreek Hill years. Um, we had the Todd McShay controversy this week where he called Travis Kelsey out of shape. Uh, they are limited on weapons. We thought there's no way the receiving core could have gotten worse than it was last year, but seemingly without Rasheed Rice, with Hollywood Brown out for the season, it actually might be worse. No. Are we it's sure? Xavier worthy. It's sure. Xavier Worthy. Um, <laughs> are we sure? That without a major move, without a trade, without something like that, that the Chiefs offense is going to figure it out this year. Phil, your thoughts? No, I'm not sure. Because last year, they had Isaiah Pacheco, and mm -hmm. they could run the ball. And mm -hmm. this year, I don't know if you guys noticed, but Carson Steele lost his job this week. He fumbled early in the game. He played, I believe, five snaps afterwards the rest of the game. He Jeez. Well, also, by the way, he was not Isaiah Pacheco when he was playing to begin with. They have Kareem Hunt, who was on his couch earlier this year, running the football regularly. They have Samaj P. Ryan, who was cut by the Broncos, who don't exactly have uh, an overwhelming number of offensive playmakers to work with, being they're, they're basically running back 1A now with Kareem Hunt. You need to do something, right? It can't just all be Patrick Mahomes smoke and mirrors. Like, you have to be able to run the ball. You have to be able to have a receiver who can win one on one. We don't know if Kelsey's that guy. He looked better in this game than he has earlier this year. I don't buy the out of shape stuff. I just think he's getting old, frankly, and he's a little slower than maybe he was in years past. But, like, this idea that 
the Chiefs are going to be just fine. Like they're not fine right now. They're winning, but they're winning yeah. despite the offense, not because of it. Maybe you don't buy that Travis Kelsey is out of shape, but he is different shape. He is not in the same shape that he once was, and I think uh, I'm not qualified to talk about this topic. The, this is clear for only, only Dominique is on this. <laughs> no, I, I, I guess I didn't mean physically. I just mean like as a performer. Like he's not running and playing the way that we saw him in the playoffs last year. That's so. The bottom line about this team is I thought they didn't have enough to do it last year. So I absolutely don't think they have enough to do it this year. And we talked about all their shortcomings on offense. We left off the left tackle situation, which is mm -hmm. also oh, a concern. Yeah. And we haven't even gotten to the reason, real reason why they had that long run last year was the defense. And the defense mm -hmm. isn't as good. They lost LeJerry Sneed or traded LeJerry Sneed. And they aren't as impactful as they um, were a season ago. So I think – the only argument for them to be a championship caliber team is that they are laying in wait and they're going to hit some switch and turn into playoff mode. But the guys who you expect to be able to do that aren't there. So mm -hmm. unless the only thing I can imagine happen is they figure out some situation at left tackle and Xavier Worthy turns into a legit top of the league, number one level receiver because he hasn't been that yet. And Rasheed Rice was their guy who was kind of their possession guy and also their number one receiver guy. And Pacheco was an uh, incredible uh, running back and catching the ball and screen stuff out of the backfield. He's gone. So, like, I don't know where these answers are going to come from. And as talented as Patrick Mahomes is, we know what he looks like when he doesn't have the support that he needs. He looks a lot closer to uh, being mortal. And so this does set up for some great mythology where – if by chance he can do it again with an even worse team than he had last season, or at least even worse offense than he had last season, that'd be mind blowing. But I can't just blindly have faith in Patrick Mahomes all the time because it's Patrick Mahomes when I'm not blind. I'm watching these games and they don't look all that impressive. I know that the point of football is to win football games. Is it? But it is, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, Second, I don't know. I disagree. I mean, yeah, for, for me, it's just to enjoy Jaden Daniels and have, have a happy time for the first time in my 34 years of existence. Um, but no, I mean, like the, the, the Chiefs offense and the Mahomes thing is like a little bit frustrating. And this is by no means going to be a criticism of Mahomes, but I think when he exploded a couple years ago, now I guess it's now like six years ago, um, but it feels like it was yesterday. Like we were looking at a statistical Marvel who is one of the most explosive offenses in the league. And to see it turn into this dink and duck offense where, you know, he's going to have multiple iterations. Like he might, maybe he'll have the Randy Moss year like the Patriots had with him. But to see that offense lack um, the ability to use one of the greatest deep ball throwers of all times, major talent, is incredibly frustrating. And I just don't know how long they can duct tape it together by just being like, oh, I have the best decision maker in the history of the sport playing quarterback. Charlie, they've been duct taping it for two years yeah. and that plane's still been in the air, though. Totally, like totally. Like that, that's the only thing is it's not even like we're sitting here the first year they were doing this. Like I recognize we just talked about why it's different, but it wasn't like they weren't duct tape and stuff all the way to the Super Bowl these past two years. Right. But after they won a Super Bowl, they took the duct tape off and they put in some rivets and then those rivets are gone. They broke already. That's the problem. And last year we keep talking about how they were duct taping the offense together. We will, we have not taken into account or at least appreciated how important that defense was to this team last year and that defense isn't here so I think you could get away with duct taping your offense when your defense was destroying people and they aren't destroying people this year and there's no reason to believe that they're going to somehow turn back into that defense and there's no reason to believe that they're going to be able to find some pieces that will stabilize the offense so it feels like if they're going to make a championship run it's going to have to be some level of high level of luck and randomness and some magic new scheme that no one's ever thought of that they can't break. It doesn't seem right. right if now. they call up the Raiders. And they're undefeated, which is crazy. The, that the I, Raiders I'm, will never do it. I was just why? thinking about it. Why? Because they're in the same division. They're yeah, never, but like, they're, they're too petty. 
but in in theory, you're taking away the Chiefs' offense uh, uh, assets long term and improving your assets. The Raiders don't think that way. Come on, they're the Ra- <laughs> they traded for Devontae Adams in the first place. They don't care about long term assets. Oh god, bro they 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 play in Las Vegas, Nevada. That is the <laughs> perfect example of why they don't care about long term assets. I, I it, make, it makes it makes all the sense in the world except for the fact that it's the Raiders. <laughs> well, okay, uh. next next one. Patrick Mahomes is like, I need my new MVS. He calls up, oh, he calls up Atlanta, and he's like, "Who went for zero catches, zero yards today? Kyle Pitts. We need you here. Do you think they could trade for Kyle Pitts, and would that change the fortunes of having just like a, a unique receiving talent that uh, Patrick Mahomes could nurture? And he was once a Caleb Williams generational type prospect. Maybe he could come back. <laughs> you mean Jaden Daniels? Um, I think the Kyle Pitts. The thing about adding these receivers is, I've said this to you before, is we always assume that we're going to get the best version of a player when we put him with Patrick Mahomes. But that hasn't been the case with all the guys that they've brought in. We haven't really gotten the best version of, I mean, I guess maybe we got the best version of Sammy Watkins, maybe. I don't know. Kadarius Tony, we didn't get the best version. MBS, we didn't get the best version. Juju, we haven't gotten the best version. And all these guys that we keep bringing in, we assume that because they're with Patrick, they're going to work out. I am done assuming that. I don't think that just if they get Kyle Pitts that all of a sudden Kyle Pitts is going to live up to the level of prospect that we did, thought he was. Did we get the best version of Kadarius Tony with the Chiefs? As a <laughs> punt Super returner. Bowl, that Super Bowl game? As a punt yeah. return. We got that one punt return. I yeah. mean, maybe the argument to Dominique's point is not to go out and trade for a wide receiver. Maybe your argument is, hey, we've made it work when we have a great defense. Let's go trade for an edge rusher. Let's go trade for a cornerback. Let's go trade for a veteran on defense who is going to make our defense so good that we can get by with, you know, Patrick Mahomes and the uh, out of structure all-stars as opposed to trying to get that number one receiver that we probably can't get the most out of between now and the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Or don't trade for anybody and and, and think and think long term and try to make this run this year, but don't debilitate your franchise in the future trying to uh make history. Yeah. It's like you had enough injuries, maybe this is just a <laughs> season and you'll they're hope four, they're, they're patch- four now. Yeah, we're talking about them like they're 0 4. You're right. Yes, they are four now. But that's because they are only one thing matters for teams like them. But, but they're not. You think they're going to win the Super Bowl? Given if they don't do anything, you think they could win the Super Bowl? I mean, they definitely could. It's like nah. if you're if you're looking at the AFC. Nah. Why not? I, they I, could get there. I it's mean, a one game Dominique, sample. Very famously, on, on this very show, I believe I predicted that the Chiefs would win 16 games in the regular season. <laughs> you're Every still on week, track, baby. Every week, I'm like, this this, this team is bad, <laughs> but they keep winning. <laughs> I feel like they're going to get there in a totally yeah. different way than I expected. Guys, do you remember how good week one Sammy Watkins was in 2019 oh, with the Chiefs when he went for 198 yards and three touchdowns? Oh, gosh. And that was. Oh, uh, uh, but he was always like he was always a week one stud every every year. He, he's still out there, Charlie. You can get Sammy Watkins if you want. Oh, gosh. I never. You remember that article? I forgot who wrote that profile on Sammy Watkins and talked about how he believed in some of the most amazingly asinine. I don't have my computer or I would look it up. Please, somebody look up I'm looking at what Sammy Watkins beliefs. Theories? Yeah, he he like I don't know. This oh, it's about dreams. He's he's got a lot of dream theories. Yeah. He like believed that he had a direct connection to God and a yeah. bunch of other things and aliens psychic superpowers yeah he thought that he had psychic superpowers and and i think he got uh talked to by aliens at some point it's and yeah okay we know more we know too much about sammy Watkins. let's (laughs) move on to the last one i'm sorry i'm sorry this is a read that article though read all thing. this is a let's do a hypothetical you sure about that (laughs) the last one still playing this game Uh, i like this game be honest (laughs) with you i want to pretend like i hate it but i kind of like this game billy it's a good game uh the jaguars are zero and four Ugh. Now we're in the hypothetical. Uh, let's imagine it was last year. They're own for last year. Um, <laughs> if this was last year, and the upcoming draft class had Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels, and the Jaguars got the oh, first gosh. pick, I'm sorry. With Charlie. Everything we know about Trevor Lawrence. Are we sure they would trade the pick and keep Trevor Lawrence, or would they consider trading Trevor Lawrence? We're keeping Bill from watching the Bills and the Ravens right now. And Lawrence is on his new contract with some. <laughs> 
that we would need a DeLorean to make uh, come <laughs> the hypothetical are you sure I mean can't we do a hypothetical this year it's like uh are there no big I mean Shador sh- come on Shador no 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 Shador. no one's no one's trading everything to have no sh- I'm not trading everything it's you have uh Trevor and someone wants to trade for Trevor who has the number one overall pick that's a that's a question that is much less hypothetical that's worth having a conversation about. Though, but like Shador Sanders, Carson Beck, Quinn Ewers are not even on the same tier of prospect as Caleb Williams. Okay, did. well then that's fine. All right, first thing we have to do. But is sure, let's figure do it out. This way. No, this no, 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 <laughs> to go back in time and make this shit happen. First, we have to uh, unlearn everything we've learned about Trevor Lawrence in the last year and a half, which this time last year, even if they got 0-4, he was still in that glow yeah. of that playoff victory, Charlie. You didn't yeah. have the last half year where the Jaguars lost like, they're, they've lost what, 11 in a row? 10 in a row? What's the... He's, he's lost nine straight starts. Now? He's lost nine straight starts. And they, lost, they lost without him in the lineup for a game last year too, I yeah. believe. Yeah. So 10 losses in a row. 0 and 4 and 0 and 10 in two seasons are two very different things. So, no, I, I don't think they're making that switch now. I mean, I absolutely don't think they made a switch either because it's the, I guess you're, you're including that we have these well, four let's, games. Let's do it this year then. If, if the hypothetical is stupid, let's do it this year. If the Jaguars got the first overall pick, should they trade Trevor Lawrence or should they trade the pick? I wonder what Lamar is doing right now. We should do our Sanders. What do you think, Lamar? Who gets into some some every single week? Josh Allen probably threw a sixty-yard <laughs> bomb right. Answer now. the question, old man. <laughs> um, no, they probably don't. They're committed to this quarterback, uh, I, and I think they still believe that they will figure it out. But I, I guess There's, the question would be who <laughs> there would be a team that there that, has to be a Shanahan disciple that could take him, right? But <laughs> it's a team that has the number one overall pick, yeah. and that team would rather have Trevor Lawrence than a cheap lottery ticket. No. Right? Like, I, I think that both sides would not want to make that trade. No. And there's a checklist we check off when a quarterback is struggling. We all know this. We all do this. It's the, okay, are his receivers good? We got to fix the receivers. Oh, the receivers are good? We got to fire the, you know, the, oh, the defense is bad? We got to fire the DC. Oh, we fired the DC? Oh, the OC's got to go. I'm sorry. We fired the OC? My head coach, you know what? It just the, the culture here, it's rotted. We got to switch it up. Once you fire the head coach, then you start thinking about changing mm, the quarterback. But you got to make all point. those other moves first, Charlie. And we're not at that point yet because Doug Peterson and Press Taylor are, to my knowledge, still they still have key cards for the office in Jacksonville. I'm not rooting for them to get fired. But I think when you have one person in this organization making like 50 plus million dollars a year and someone else, I don't know what he's making, probably six or seven million dollars a year. I guarantee you they're going to fire Doug Peterson before they even think about replacing trevor lawrence so no i i think i think there are other people to blame and other people who are going to be blamed before they would really consider anything with trevor lawrence i feel confident that in my example that if the jaguars are bad enough this year to get the first overall pick they'll have fired doug peterson yeah. in the middle of the season yes. so he's already gone press yes, taylor's probably sure. also already gone they have the first overall pick when yours let's That's, just say it's shador for the uh, for the comedy yeah shador sure. would be even more fun i can't imagine shador in jacksonville if you're the That'd Panthers and you could oh. take Shador or you could trade for Trevor Lawrence. Oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. It's I definitely time to go. I want to go watch Derrick Henry run the ball and Josh Allen also look like Derrick Henry running the ball. <laughs> We're out. This has been a Dominique Foxworth show again presented by All State. Throw your hands up. Thanks, Bill. You're the best. Charlie, you're even better. We're out. This is the Dominique Foxworth show. 